Good evening, and thank you for joining me for another Boring Books for Bedtime. I hope tonight's selection provides all the boredom your busy brain needs to quiet down and let you get some sleep. Before we begin, I'd like to give a special shout out of thanks to some new members of our Patreon family. Jess, Sarah, Fiona, Amanda, Anne, and not Jim Carrey. Thank you all so much for supporting this podcast. By becoming members of Patreon, you help us remain 100% listener-supported and ad-free for everyone, and it's very much appreciated. If you're interested in supporting Boring Books for Bedtime and finding out more about the perks available to subscribers, including exclusive episodes heard nowhere else, you'll find a link to Patreon in the show description. You'll also find a link to buymeacoffee.com where you can support us with a one-time tip, no subscription required. I hope you'll take a moment to check them out. Now, let's read and relax. Find a comfortable spot. Adjust your volume. Take a nice deep breath in. Let it out slowly. And off we go. Tonight, for the first time in some time, let's continue our exploration of one of the more curious theories about the Earth, with more from Sim's theory of concentric spheres, demonstrating that the Earth is hollow, habitable within, and widely open about the poles, by a citizen of the United States, printed and published in 1826 by Morgan Lodge and Fisher, Cincinnati. Let's pick up right where we left off in this interesting proof at Chapter 5. Let's begin. Chapter 5 the theory of concentric spheres, supported by arguments drawn from terrestrial facts, such as the migration of animals to and from the Arctic regions, and from refraction, and the variation of the compass observed in high northern latitudes. I would now advert to a few of the known terrestrial facts which have a tendency to support the theory advanced by Captain Sims, such as the migration of animals, including beasts, birds, and fishes, in the Arctic regions, and from refraction, and the variation of the compass, as observed in high northern latitudes. It is a fact well attested by whalers and fishers in the northern seas, and one that almost every author who adverts to the northern fisheries confirms that innumerable and almost incredible numbers of whales, mackerel, herring, and other migratory fish annually come down in the spring season of the year from the Arctic seas towards the equator. Some authors describe the shoals of herring alone to be equal in surface to the island of Great Britain. Besides these, innumerable shoals of other fish also come down. These fish, when they first come from the north in the spring, are in their best plight and fattest condition, but as the season advances and they move on to the southward, they become poor, so much so that by the time they get on the coast of France or Spain, as fishermen say, they are scarce worth catching. The history of the migratory fish affords strong grounds to conclude that the shoals which come from the north are like swarms of bees from the mother hive, never to return, particularly the herring and other small fish. They are not known to return in shoals, and it is doubted by some writers on the subject 
whether any of them ever return north again, or whether they are not entirely consumed by men and by other fish. Whalers and other fishermen who go to the north generally prosecute their business in the seas between latitudes 60 and 70 degrees, where whales are most abundant. Pinkerton in his voyages states that the Dutch, who at different periods got detained in the ice and were compelled to winter in high northern latitudes, could find but few fish to subsist on during the winter, which proves that the migrating fish do not winter amongst or on this side of the ice. All these facts relative to fish appear to be well authenticated. Now, were the Earth a compact and solid spheroid according to the old theory, and were the seas frozen nearly to the bottom at the poles, as we would be led to conclude, where could all those fish that come down to us every spring breed? Or if they even all returned in the autumn, and all the north were a sea that did not freeze even to the poles, it would require a great stretch of credulity to imagine where they could obtain food for the winter, or even if their source of food were inexhaustible, could the region of the pole afford space sufficient for their health so as to migrate south in the spring? If the earth be not hollow, or at least greatly concave about the poles, where could all those fish find room in winter? But on Sims's plan, admitting the globe to be a hollow sphere and the inner or concave part as habitable as without, at least as habitable for fish, the whole matter is at once explained. Whales and various fish delight in cold regions. According to Sims's theory, a zone at a short distance beyond the real verge of the sphere, which constitutes the coldest part, or, as he has thought proper to term it, the icy circle, commencing at the highest point, in about latitude 68 degrees, in the northern sea near Norway, thence gradually declining to about latitude 50 degrees in the Pacific Ocean, which is the lowest point, and thence regularly round again to the highest point. A certain distance beyond this, and short of the apparent verge, this zone or icy circle exists, which is believed to be the coldest region of the earth. After passing this, we would advance into the interior of the globe and into a milder clime. In the interior region it is contended those immense shoals of fish are propagated and grow, which annually come out and afford us such an abundant supply. Nor does it appear that the interior parts of the sphere are altogether forsaken by the fish in summer, for shoals of fat mackerel and herring come down from the north in autumn as well as in the spring. The seal, another animal found in cold regions, is also said to migrate north twice each year, going once beyond the icy circle to produce their young, and again to complete their growth, always returning remarkably fat, an evidence that they find something more than snow and ice to feed on in the country to which they migrate. Numerous other facts of importance relative to the migration of quadrupeds are well authenticated by travelers and others, particularly that of the reindeer. In Reese's Cyclopedia, under the head Hudson's Bay, it is stated that the reindeer are seen in the spring season of the year, about the month of March or April, coming down from the north in droves of eight or ten thousand and that they are known to return northward in the month of October, when the snow becomes deep. Hudson's Bay is situated between 60 and 65 degrees north latitude. We are informed by Professor Adams of St. Petersburg that on the northern coast of Asia, 
Every autumn, the reindeer start northeastwardly from the river Lena and return again in spring in good condition. The mouth of the river Lena is in about latitude 70 degrees north. It appears to me rather a mystery, according to the old theory of the earth, for why should those deer, when the cold commences, seek a colder climate and a more sterile country? The inhospitable coast of Liberia and Hudson's Bay, in the gloom of a dark winter, I should suppose would be cold enough, without their seeking to spend the winter among nothing but eternal mountains of ice at the pole, where nature must be robed in snows and crowned with storms. Hearn, who traveled very high north and northwest on the continent of America, details various facts in his journal, which strongly corroborate Sims's position. Some of the facts he attempts to explain agreeably to his own ideas, and others he considers inexplicable. Among a great collection of facts, he states that large droves of musk oxen abound within the Arctic Circle, few of which ever come so far south as the Hudson's Bay factories. He mentions seeing in the course of one day several herds of those animals, of 70 or 80 in a herd, in about latitude 68 degrees. He states that the polar white bears are very rarely found by any of the Indians in winter, and that their winter retreats appear to be unknown, that they are sometimes seen retiring towards the sea on the ice in autumn, and appear again in great numbers in the latter end of March, bringing their young with them. Hearn also states that the white or arctic foxes are some years remarkably plentiful and always come from the north, that their numbers almost exceed credibility, that it is well known none of them ever migrate again to the northward, and that naturalists are at a loss to know where they originate. He also mentions that all kinds of game as well as fish in those high latitudes, are at some seasons excessively plentiful, and at others extremely scarce. These facts strongly corroborate the doctrine of a hollow sphere. Otherwise, why should the reindeer and other animals migrate north instead of south, as our buffalo on the plains of Missouri do when pressed with snow and cold weather? Instinct generally leads animals to fruitful and productive rather than unproductive regions. Why then proceed north on the approach of winter unless in expectation of finding a warmer climate, or at least a more mild and plentiful country beyond the icy circle? Independent of the immense droves of reindeer, great numbers of musk oxen, White bears and white foxes spend their winters towards the north, which tends to establish the fact that a considerable extent of land must exist in that quarter of the earth. This, however, would infringe on the space necessary to accommodate the vast quantities of fish which appear to be propagated in that region, if the old system were true. If we were to judge of the internal surface of the sphere by its animal productions, admitting that those animals heretofore enumerated are propagated there, we should conclude that the internal region of the earth is as much more favorable to the support of animal life as the reindeer is larger than our deer and the white bear larger than our bear. And consequently, we must conclude that there are more salubrious climates and better countries within than any we have yet discovered without. Hearn also informs us that swans, geese, brants, ducks, and other wild waterfowl are so numerous about Hudson's Bay in the spring and summer that the company every season 
salt up vast quantities of them, sometimes sixty or seventy hogsheads. He enumerates ten different species of geese, several of which, particularly the snow geese, the blue geese, Brent geese, and horned wavy, lay their eggs and raise their young in some country unknown even to the Indians, as their eggs and young are never seen by them. Neither have the most accurate observers been able to discover where they make their winter residence, as it is well known that they do not migrate to the southward. But few of them ever pass to the south and some of the species are said never to have been seen south of latitude 59 degrees. Most of those fowls molt or shed their feathers in a peculiar manner, in summer, and become nearly naked. Hence it would seem that they must breed in winter while absent, for it is impossible that they could lay and sit whilst molting, whereas the migratory geese and ducks in this country are not known to shed their feathers in any great degree and are well known to raise their young in the summer whilst in the north. It may therefore be inferred that many of those waterfowls which Hearn describes raise their young beyond the icy circle and within the sphere. As many of the ten species of geese he saw there are unknown further south, it establishes the fact that they do not come to the south to winter. In the papers of the Honorable D. Barrington and Colonel Beaufoy, on the possibility of approaching the North Pole, read before the Royal Society of London, there is an extensive collection of instances cited where navigators have reached high northern latitudes, from which it appears to be well authenticated that navigators have in numerous instances reached the latitude of 82, 83, and 84 degrees, and some are said to have sailed as far north as 88 and 89 degrees. It is almost uniformly stated that in those high latitudes, the sea is clear of ice, or nearly so, and the weather moderate. To cite the various instances in which navigators have sailed far north would be too tedious. The whole book principally consists of a series of facts which have a strong bearing on the subject, and to which I would refer the reader who feels disposed to investigate. The whole appears to strengthen the opinion that there is a barrier or circle of ice about where the whalers go to fish. But when that is past, we come to an open sea and a more temperate region. The sea is stated to be open and always clear of ice, even in the middle of winter, on the northern part of Spitsbergen, which is situated in latitude 80 degrees north, and the further north the more clear it is of ice. But at the same season, on the southern parts of Spitsbergen, the sea is bound up with solid and compact ice. If the doctrine be true that the earth is a solid spheroid, the cold must increase regularly as we approach the pole, and consequently vegetation invariably diminish. This, however, is ascertained not to be the fact. Nova Zembla, which is situated in north latitude 76 degrees, produces no timber, nor even a blade of grass. Consequently, all the quadrupeds which frequent it are foxes and bears, both carnivorous animals. On the coast of Greenland, about latitude 65 and 70 degrees, neither timber nor grass grows, while on the northern parts of Spitsbergen they have reindeer, which are often exceedingly fat, and Mr. Gray mentions three or four species of plants which grow and flower there during the summer. 
On any meridian passing through England, it is ascertained to be more temperate at the latitude of 80 degrees north than at 73 degrees, and both Pinkerton and Barrington inform us that beyond the latitude of 75 degrees, the north winds are frequently warm in winter, that in the middle of winter for several weeks there falls almost continued rain, and that vegetables and animals are more abundant at the latitude of 80 degrees than at 76 degrees. It has long been observed that the climates vary very considerably on the same parallels of latitude. New York, which is situated in latitude 40 degrees, is known to be considerably colder in the winter than London, which is situated in latitude 55 degrees, and the parallel of latitude 40 degrees on the plains of Missouri is much colder than the city of New York. The climate at St. Peter's on the Mississippi, which is in latitude 46 degrees, is said to be considerably colder than Quebec, this difference of climate has by some been attempted to be accounted for on the principle that land is colder than water and that the cold is occasioned by the large portion of land in the continent of America. However, I submit to the consideration of the reader whether so great a difference could arise from a cause of this nature. In the Northern Sea, between Spitsbergen and the continent of America, there is a strong current which always comes from the north and sets southwardly. It has been stated by some that in the spring season of the year, the water of this current is warmer and fresher than the surrounding water of the sea. Various other currents have, at different times, been observed in different parts of the sea, setting from the north. Floating southwardly on these currents have been seen large masses of ice from freshwater rivers, with wolves and bears occasionally on them. New fallen trees have also been seen floating from the north, and various kinds of timber, some of which the species have hitherto been unknown are frequently found lodged on the northern part of the coast of Norway, having drifted from some region still farther north. Trees have also been found floating in the ocean at latitude 80 degrees, when no timber is known to grow north of latitude 70 degrees. Also, seeds unknown to our botanists and those of tropical plants have been found drifted on the coast of Norway and parts adjacent, many of which were in so fresh a state as to vegetate and grow, when it is well known that no plant of their species comes to perfection in any known climate far without the tropics. And what makes the matter particularly extraordinary is that these things appear to be drifted by currents coming from the north when according to the old theory, we must believe the sea to be always frozen at the poles, which would render it difficult, if not impossible, to account for the existence of the currents at all. In the United States of America and in Europe, the aurora borealis is always seen to the north, but many of those travelers and navigators who penetrated to high northern latitudes observed the aurora borealis in the south and never in the north. The region in which it is believed to exist is supposed to be about the place where the verge commences and about 50 or 60 miles above the plane of the Earth's surface and that the travelers who discovered these appearances south of them were at that time beyond the verge. The Indians discovered by Captain Ross on the coast of Baffin's Bay in the summer of 1818, in latitude 75 degrees 55 minutes north, when interrogated from whence they came, pointed to the north, where according to their account, there were plenty of people, 
that it was a warmer country and that there was much water there. And when Captain Ross informed them that he came from the contrary direction, pointing to the south, they replied that could not be, because there was nothing but ice in that direction. Consequently, these people must live in a country not composed of ice, for it appears they deem such a one uninhabitable. Hence we must infer, if the relation given by Captain Ross be correct, that north of where they then were, the climate becomes more mild and is habitable. A change, the cause of which is not easily accounted for, on the old philosophic principles. In high northern latitudes, owing to refraction, or some other peculiar circumstance, which hitherto has not, to my knowledge, been attempted to be accounted for, the extent of vision appears to be greatly increased, so that objects much further than the ordinary distance are distinctly seen, frequently appearing elevated above the sea or their real situation, and their image sometimes pictured in the sky. The real objects themselves are sometimes seen with the naked eye, 140 or 150 miles, and sometimes at the astonishing distance of 200 miles. These facts are well attested by Captain Ross and other navigators. How this can be accounted for, on the formation maintained by the old theory, I cannot conjecture. I believe it is admitted that the deck of a vessel at sea, anywhere between the equator and latitude 50 or 60 degrees, cannot be discovered, even by the best telescope, at a greater distance than 12 or 15 miles. Nay, were there no end to vision, and could the eye penetrate 200 miles through our atmosphere with sufficient clearness, it would require an observer to be elevated about five miles before he could discover an object on the surface of the earth 200 miles distant. But on the edge of the verge of the polar opening, if the atmosphere was clear and the power of vision strong enough, an observer might discover objects situated on the verge at any point all round the sphere as they would be on an exact plane with the observer. And on the contrary, traveling across the verge from the convexity to the concavity of the sphere, a very few miles make objects disappear. All northern navigators and travelers agree that high north the sun becomes less bright and the sky darker than in more southern latitudes. Is not this owing to the rays of the sun being refracted round the verge of the polar opening? Another circumstance observed by navigators who have visited high latitudes is that the latitude and longitude, as found by celestial observation, frequently differ very materially, sometimes as much as one half, from that given by the log line. It has also been observed that the mercury in the barometer is less fluctuating in northern regions than it is further south. Those appearances observed in the southern hemisphere, which are termed Magellanic clouds by navigators, have not, so far as I know, been accounted for. They are three in number, of an irregular shape, and observed by night in the South Atlantic and the southeast parts of the Pacific Oceans, reversed from New Holland and New Zealand, but never visible in the eastern parts of the Indian Ocean. Their color is like that of far distant mountains on which the sun is shining. In the one sea, they appear due south, and in the other, to the left. They are stationary, appearing perpetually fixed at a certain height, and in a particular situation, 
as viewed from any given place. The stars and the heavens in their diurnal revolutions sweep by them and they remain the same. To the navigator who proceeds to the east or west, they appear to be more or less to the right or left of the meridian in proportion as he changes his longitude, and as he sails south, they increase in height until they reach the zenith and finally become north when seen by an observer south of the Straits of Magellan, which is in latitude 52 degrees south. Captain Sims accounts for the appearance of these clouds by the great refractive power of the atmosphere about the polar openings, causing the opposite side of the verge to appear pictured in the sky. As navigators inform us, objects do sometimes appear in the Arctic regions, and in the manner Scoresby's ship appeared in the sky, with every particular about her so accurately represented as to be at once identified by the observers, though the vessel at that time was at such a distance as to render it rather incredible how she could be seen at all. As proof of this position, Captain Sims alleges that the relative position, shape, and proportions of these clouds agree in their general outlines with the southern part of New Zealand, the southeast part of New Holland, and the whole of Van Diemen's land, which are situated on and near to the verge of the sphere, opposite to where the clouds are visible. These clouds are only seen in the night when the atmosphere is clear, at which time the sun is shining on the islands in question. Hence it is alleged that from these facts, their relative appearance is deducible. As we are never sensible that the rays of light are refracted by the medium through which they pass before they reach our visual organs, we frequently imagine objects to be situated where they really are not, and such is believed to be the case as respects Van Diemen's and the circumjacent land as before described. Franklin, in his journey far north on the continent of America, discovered a cloud which appeared to remain always in the same position and which the Indians informed him was permanent. Not having the book at hand, I cannot now advert particularly to what he says on the subject, but from memory only, recollect that he states something to that effect. If such an appearance exists there, may it not be accounted for in the same manner as the Magellanic clouds? Navigators who have sailed far north admit the variation of the needle to be excessive. Captain Ross found it in Baffin's Bay to be as much as 110 degrees, and Parry, during his voyage in 1822, found it so changed that the needle pointed within about 14 degrees of south. All, I believe, concur that this is a phenomenon which universally occurs in high northern latitudes, but it has hitherto remained unexplained. I believe, according to the old theory, the needle is imagined to be attracted by something at or near the pole. Were this supposition correct, the needle would uniformly maintain its polarity on proceeding north, on any given meridian, until you arrived at the very pole itself. The possibility of a moving magnetic cause is difficult, if not impossible, to be reconciled with a solid globe. Yet that the magnetic needle does vary on the same meridian, and to a most extraordinary degree, in high northern latitudes, is confirmed beyond all doubt. Why not then urge the variableness of the magnetic cause against the possibility of a solid globe? According to the doctrine of hollow spheres, this whole mystery of the variation of the compass can be satisfactorily explained. 
The magnetic needle, it is believed, regards the center of the polar opening and not the pole or axis of the Earth. It will be recollected that the axis of the Earth, being at an angle of 12 or 15 degrees from the plane of the polar openings, causes one part of the verge to extend farther north than the other, the highest part of which is nearly on a meridian running through Spitsbergen, in about latitude 68 degrees, and the lowermost side in about the 50th degree. Now, in proceeding north on the first meridian, running near Spitsbergen, there ought to be no variation of the needle until you arrive at the apparent verge, when the needle would cease to traverse, and by proceeding onwards would turn and point south. Should you proceed north on a meridian west of this, when you approached the apparent verge, the needle would seem to turn west, but in reality, it would be the meridian turning to the right, along the verge to its highest or most northerly point, the needle keeping at a right angle with the verge, and in like manner pursuing a course north on a meridian east of Spitsbergen. On your approach to the apparent verge, the needle would still direct its course at a right angle into the polar opening, governed most probably by some principle of electricity or other property contained in matter and kept in one position subject to the shape of the earth, which may not even yet be exactly known. The meridian would here wind to the left and conduct you to the highest point of the apparent verge north of Spitsbergen. Hence the variation of the needle would be east in Asia and west in America, which I am told is the fact. From an examination of the variation of the compass, as ascertained in different degrees of latitude and longitude, it increases as you proceed north and west, which would be exactly the case in accordance with the theory of concentric spheres. Admitting the Earth to be a solid globe, and the cause of magnetism to be some attractive power at the pole, how could the needle vary differently on the same meridian, in different latitudes, at the same period of time, or vary at the same place at different periods of time? But admit the doctrine contended for by the advocates of concentric spheres, and it can be satisfactorily explained. The observations of modern astronomers have ascertained that the poles or axis of the Earth are not always directed to the same fixed star, and of consequence that the axis does not always remain parallel to itself. This variation is discovered to be about 51 minutes annually, which would make a degree in about 71 years, Hence the needle always pointing to the polar opening would vary in about that proportion at the same place in the same period of time. Chapter 6 Facts Tending to Illustrate and Prove the Existence of a Mid-Plane Space Situated Between the Concave and Convex Surfaces of the Sphere According to Sims's theory, each sphere has an intermediate cavity or mid-plane space of considerable extent situated between the convex and concave surfaces of the sphere, filled with a very light and elastic fluid, rarefied in proportion to the gravity or condensing power of the exposed surfaces of the respective spheres, and also various other less cavities or spaces between the larger or principal one and the outer and inner surfaces of the spheres, each filled with a similar fluid or gas, most probably partaking much of the nature of hydrogen. This fluid is lighter than that in which the sphere floats, 
and has a tendency to poise it in universal space. The spheres in many parts of the unfathomable ocean is believed to be water quite through from the concave or convex surfaces to the great mid-plane space, and probably the earthy or solid matter of the sphere may in many places extend quite through from one surface to the other, tending like ribs or braces to support the sphere in its proper form. Such a formation of spheres appears to be supported by various facts and phenomena, amongst the most prominent of which are volcanoes and earthquakes. Many volcanic mountains burst out and burn for ages, discharging from the bowels of the earth immense quantities of lava, pumice, and various substances of various kinds. Some of these mountains have been burning for thousands of years, at least as far back as the records of history have been made known to us. Had the earth at its formation been a solid globe, four times as hard as hammered iron at the center, and gradually lessening in density towards the surface, we must admit that it would still be solid matter. Governing ourselves by these principles, how can we imagine that such immense caverns, filled with combustible matter, as would be necessary to supply those volcanoes from time immemorial, could have existed? However, that they do exist is certain, which I think is in no way more easily accounted for than on the plan of a mid-plane space, or of spaces filled with a certain hydrogenous gas, which being much lighter than atmospheric air, if there should be any small aperture or crevice extending from the surface to the space beneath, the gravity of the outer part of the sphere pressing on it would occasion a portion of this gas to escape through the aperture, and as it comes in contact with the oxygen of the atmosphere would take fire and occasion those tremendous explosions, which we know do sometimes take place and cause those mountains to burn for years until the cavity which supplied the volcanic matter becomes exhausted, or until some shock or convulsion consequent on the burning may have loosened rocks or earth of the denser part of the sphere, which falling into the aperture choke it up. Hence the gas ceasing to escape, the volcano would cease to burn until some shock or accident should again open the aperture. The elastic fluid with which the mid-plane cavities are filled, being forced out into the common atmosphere, the greater degree of gravity would condense and set free its latent heat and be resolved into its original base, somewhat as coal gas, out of the tube of a gaslight apparatus, yields up its latent heat by condensation. Hence steam burns when mixed with coal gas. If the earth be a solid globe, I am at a loss to account for the principles on which earthquakes occur. Long before I heard of Sims's theory, or perhaps before it had an existence in the mind of man, when reading accounts of earthquakes, it appeared to me altogether unaccountable that such violent concussions could take place in one part of the world and not be felt throughout the globe. It appears altogether inconsistent that one part of a solid piece of matter would be shaken so violently without affecting the whole mass. We are informed by authentic history that whole islands and vast sections of country have been sunk by earthquakes and never more heard of. On the other hand, islands which are now inhabited and productive have been raised, apparently, from the bottom of the unfathomable ocean. How such things occur, I am unable to divine. If the globe be solid, on what principle could a large portion of its surface, which is said to be lighter than the parts beneath, 
sink into a dense medium. How could a heavy mass, lying a thousand fathoms deep at the bottom of the ocean, rise and be suddenly elevated above the surface of the water, when all below is so compact and governed by an opposite and immutable tendency? It appears to be a solecism in nature. The writer had once an opportunity of witnessing some of the effects of earthquakes. It was his fortune to be on the Mississippi River in the year 1812, at the time when that country was so violently convulsed with an earthquake. He saw and heard innumerable explosions, as though a large quantity of air had been confined in the bowels of the earth, and seeking vent rushed out with a tremendous sound, forcing up considerable quantities of sand through the apertures, in many instances mixed with black muddy water and a substance resembling stone coal or carbonated wood, which emitted a strong bituminous odor when exposed to fire. At one place the river was stopped in its course a short time, the water rose to a considerable height above its common level, and on the west side of the channel of the river, there was a countercurrent for a few minutes of an astonishing velocity. So great was its force that for some distance the cottonwood and willows on the margin of the river were either prostrated or bent up the stream, and their branches looked as if they had been dragged a long way on the ground. The waters of the river soon subsided and flowed in their natural direction. So tremendous were those explosions that when happening under large trees, the tenacity of their texture yielded at once to their force, and the largest in the forest were split and fractured from root to top. During these convulsions, the ground on which the town of New Madrid is situated together with the country for several miles round, sunk about five feet below its former elevation, in which situation it has remained. Eight years afterwards, the writer was again on the same spot. The desolate aspect, which the country presented at the time he witnessed those scenes, was measurably obliterated, but the banks of the river were still in their sunken situation. How could all those violent convulsions take place at this point and not be felt at New Orleans, along the sea coast of the United States and other places? Whence came this water and air, which issued from those apertures in the earth? And why did the river for a few minutes flow in a contrary direction and then resume its natural course. If the earth be a compact and solid globe, I can account for none of these things. But admitting the formation of the sphere to be such as I contend for, they are all resolved into the most simple principles, and what would otherwise be impenetrable mystery is made as plain as noonday. If the sphere be formed as I allege, those concussions were doubtless occasioned by the gas or fluid in the mid-plane, or some intermediate space near the surface, which by being suddenly rarefied would make it expand and cause the upper part of the sphere to be suddenly elevated in the neighborhood of the little prairie. And hence the waters of the river pursuing the laws of gravity, would flow in a contrary direction. This sudden expansion and elevation of the surface would cause apertures, through which the rare gas would escape, and the surface would then settle down again, not only to its former level, but as a considerable portion of this gas had escaped, the remaining part would occupy less space, Hence the surface of the country around New Madrid would be below its former situation.
And with that irrefutable proof, I think we'll end this evening's reading from Sim's Theory of Concentric Spheres, demonstrating that the Earth is hollow, habitable within, and widely open about the poles. A work which, while completely incorrect, does present an interesting study in how people try to make sense of the world around them, and for that, it's a little admirable. I hope you enjoyed that. If you'd like to read this fascinating work for yourself, as always, you'll find a link to a free ebook from Project Gutenberg in the show description. If you'd like to connect, suggest a boring book you'd like to hear read, or request more from one we've already started, you can drop me an email via our website, www.boringbookspod.com. It's always a pleasure to hear from you. Thank you so much for joining me for this evening's reading. Until our next boring book, good night. <laughs>